The purpose of this session is to look at the normalization of floating point numbers and basically understand why we need to normalize and how underflow and overflow can occur. From the previous lesson, you should have a good understanding of how to calculate floating point numbers, either from binary to binary floating point or vice versa. If you don't understand that, my suggestion is to go back and rewatch those videos, practice a bit, and then continue with this video. So let's start by looking at the normalization of floating point numbers. Why do we need to normalize? Let's start with the concept of precision. In principle, a decision has to be made about the format of a floating point representation, both with the regards of the total number of bits to be used and the split between those bits, how many are going to be representing the mantissa and how many are going to be representing the exponent. Are you going to go with eight bits and four for mantissa or four for exponent, or you're going to go for 16 bits, 12 for mantissa, and 4 for exponent, that's the decision you need to make. In practice, a choice for the total number of bits to be used will be available as an option when the program is written. So you, as the programmer, will decide how many bits to allocate for mantissa and exponent for your program. In order to achieve maximum precision, it is necessary to normalize a floating point number. Now what does that actually mean? Precision is basically the accuracy of the number, the amount of detail that number will have, the amount of decimal points perhaps that you might actually use. Since precision increases with an increasing number of bits for the mantissa, it follows that for optimum precision, we need to ensure that we make maximum use of those bits. Now, if the binary floating point is towards the right-hand side, that basically means we are not making maximum use of that. Therefore, we tend to move the binary point to the left next to the sign bit. And we've been practicing with that when we were trying to calculate floating point binary representation in the previous lesson. Now, this can lead to another problem. If you increase the number of bits for the mantissa, that gives you better precision for a value, but that leaves fewer bits for the exponent. So that reduces the range of possible value. Now, in an exam, this is very important for you to remember. The accuracy or the precision increases if you allocate more bits for the mantissa and the range increases if you allocate more bits for the exponent. So if you increase the accuracy or the precision of a number, therefore the range will decrease. If you increase the range, which means that you increase the exponent side, allocate more number of bits to it, then the precision or the accuracy is reduced. So what do you need to remember as a programmer? You decide how many bits to allocate for mantissa and exponent, and it's a balancing act depending on the needs of your program. And in practice, all bits in the mantissa are significant as there are no wasted leading zero bits. In practice, this basically means using the largest possible magnitude for the value that you want to represent, hence moving the binary point just after the sign bit. Now let's look at this in practice how precision and normalization actually works. On screen, you see different ways to represent plus two, okay? So we can have 0.125 times two to the power of four, 0 0.25 times two to the power of three, 0 0.5 times two to the power of two. And you also see the floating point binary representation. Now the second table works out a negative number, same kind of process. I'll leave that up to you to work out what the negative number is and the floating point binary representation of it. What I want you to focus on though is, what do you notice in both tables with the highest magnitude mantissa part? So pause the video and look at both tables carefully, the right hand column, floating point binary representation. And if you've forgotten what the format is, the first bit is the sign bit, the next three bits are the mantissa, and the last four bits are the exponent values. So how do you work out the magnitude? Well, if you look at the Deanery representation, which one is the biggest value? especially for the mantissa, and the mantissa part is the left-hand part, for example, 0 0.125, 0 0.25, and 0 0.5. So quite clearly, in the first table, 0 0.5 is the highest magnitude. And similarly, if you go down to the bottom, you'll probably see that 1 is the biggest magnitude or the highest magnitude. So do pause the video and go through this. Okay, you should have spotted this. When the magnitude is the largest, there's a pattern emerging between the first two bits of each set of values. The two most significant bits are different for the highest magnitude values. 
This fact can be used to recognize that a number is in a normalized representation or not. And you don't have to take my word for it. You might want to try this out with different types of numbers or maybe try to normalize 3.5, 5.4, minus 8, whatever. And you'll always see this type of pattern emerging where the highest magnitude will always be represented by the two most significant bits being different. So if it's a positive number, you'll have 0 at the front and 1 as the second digit. That's a normalized number. If it's a negative number, you'll have 1 for the sign bit and 0 for the second bit. And this fact can be used to identify whether a number is normalized or not. OK, time to apply your knowledge now. On screen, you see a few questions. The first two parts you've already attempted as part of a previous video. So you're going to go through parts 3, 4, and 5. Pause the video and go through these questions. Don't forget to share your answers with me. OK, let's summarize everything that we've gone through over the last two lessons. Converting deanery to floating point representations. Let's look at this example, 39.75 into binary floating point. So first, we convert it to binary. How far do we need to move the binary point to the left so the number is normalized? Remember, to normalize the number, the first two significant bits need to be different. So in this case, we'll need to move six places to the left to get it to the right place, as you can see. So to get our point back to where it started, we need to move six places to the right. Therefore, six now becomes your exponent. Here's another view of the same process, 39.75 to binary floating point. We use fixed point notation. 39 becomes 32 plus 4, 36 plus 2 plus 1. And 0.75 is a half and a quarter. Now we move the point to normalize it, so it should either become 0, 1 or 1, 0 at the front. Also try to remember how many places the point needs to be moved. In our case, we're moving it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places before the leading 1 because there's a zero in front of it, so between 64 and 32. Now, because it's moved six places, the exponent becomes six. So we write the new mantis and exponent separately using the same amount of bits, or the allocated bits as given to us in the exam. Try to apply your knowledge by converting 67 into binary floating point and using 10 bits for the mantissa and six bits for the exponent. Pause the video and have a go. Now you should have had something along the lines of this, 67 is actually 64 plus 2 plus 1, and there's nothing on the right hand side, so all of those become 0. Now since we need to normalize it, we're going to move the binary point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 places between 128 and 64. Now since it's moved 7 places to the left, the exponent becomes 7. So we rewrite the new exponent and mantissa using 10 bits for the mantissa and 6 bits for the exponent. Now what happens when you get an odd fractional part, which is not 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.125 equivalent, that kind of thing? Say you get something like 5.88. How would you convert this into a binary floating point number, especially without using a calculator? Now the 5 part is pretty easy, 0, 1, 0, 1. We've got that sorted. To work out the 0.88, we need to multiply that by 2. So we're going to use a different type of algorithm. So 0.88 times 2 gives you 1.76. We keep the 1 and we use it for the first fractional part. So the value becomes 0 0.1. We then discard the 1 and keep the 0 0.76 and multiply it by 2. This time we get 1.52. We add that 1 to our original fractional part, which now becomes 0 0.11, and we discard the 1 and keep the 52. And we multiply by 2 again. This time we get 1.04. We keep the 1 again, so it's now 0 0.111 for the fractional part. And we, we discard the 1 and keep the 0 0.04. So 0 0.04 times 2 is 0 0.08. This time we do not have a 1, so that basically means we're going to keep the 0 and the fractional part becomes 0 0.1110. And we can keep on doing this until you reach six values, as we have six bits for the exponent, or you can keep on doing this till 8, 10, 12, whatever amount of bits you might have for the fractional part or the exponent part. So now what we have is 
zero one zero one for the five and we have one 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 zero 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 in this particular case if you manage to work out the rest for the fractional part which is the point eighty eight now once you have that we normalize it again to normalize it we will need to move the binary point one two three places between eight and four so our exponent becomes three and our mantissa becomes zero one zero one 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 zero and this is the way we can handle even tricky fractional parts which are not conventional just simply multiply them with two keep the integer part and keep on multiplying it by two until you fill the amount of bits you are required by the question and here you can also spot a problem if you try to resolve this new binary floating point number that we've just calculated because of the limited number of bits allocated if you look on the fractional side you've got a half a quarter and an eighth which is 0.5 plus 0.25 plus 0.125 which actually equates to 0.875 so 5.88 is currently being represented as 5.875 not quite an exact number and that can lead to calculation errors and all sorts of problems and this is where it can become quite tricky because computers often have difficulty when they're working with real numbers because they don't quite fit into the binary pattern let's look at another worked example here this time we're going to be using 10 bits for the mantissa 6 bits for the exponent and we've got 128.25 now the 128 is pretty easy, you know, just a simple 1 in the 128 column and the rest of them are zeros. And the 0.25 is also pretty easy because it's 0 0.01, which is basically a quarter. Now this one is not normalized because the binary point is to the right hand side. So we need to shift it towards the sign bit. So after normalization, we end up with 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 and all those zeros. And you can see that it's moved eight places to the left. So the exponent becomes eight. Now when you put these new values into the 10 bits for the mantissa, you should notice that the last remaining one has to be dropped. That means we lose accuracy. And that's a big problem, or could be a big problem, and that's where allocating the right amount of bits for mantissa and exponent becomes crucial. Now let's look at another example. This time we're looking at a 16-bit floating point number with 10 bits for the mantissa and 6 bits for the exponent. Remember the binary point is between the first and second most significant bits for a normalized number. So this one will be between the first zero and one. Okay. And since the first 10 bits are the mantissa, we can separate this 16 bit number into two sets. The first 10 bits for the mantissa and the last six bits for the exponent. And you might get an exam question like this where you're just given the above information. 10 bits for the mantissa, 6 bits for the exponent, and you will need to separate all of the parts yourself. We know that sine bit is 0, so that basically means that the mantissa is positive. Next, we work out the exponent value, which is pretty clear. It's 1. This helps us to move the binary point one place to the right. Now, think back to the Dean reconversion process. If it's positive, we go right. If it's negative, we go left. And the new number becomes 0, 1, binary point, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the rest. Now, we place these with the appropriate headings and we actually end up with the value 1. And that's basically the end result of this. Now, time to apply your own knowledge. Work out the deanery for the following, using 10 bits for the mantissa and 6 bits for the exponent. Pause the video and have a go. Hopefully, you got plus 13 as an answer. And how did we work this out? Well, we first checked the sign. So the mantissa starts with zero, therefore it's a positive number. We then work out the exponent value, which is the slide step. So we slide towards the exponent. We take the six bits at the end and we work out that the exponent is also plus six. Now we bounce the binary point. So we need to move it six places to the right because the exponent is positive. So we move that and now we get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, binary point triple zero. Step four normally is the flip, and flip basically means we need to do the two's complement part. But since our number isn't negative, we don't need to do this step. And the final bit is called swim, so we work out the value on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the binary point. Now the three zeros on the right-hand side are indeed zero, and if you look at 1101, one, one, 
that's basically 1 plus 4 and an 8, which works out to be 13. So hopefully you arrive to the same answer. Now why am I using these new terms, sign, slide, bounce, flip, swim? Well, that's because some people find it very difficult to remember the algorithmic steps. So these type of mnemonics or these type of word-based patterns make it easier for them to remember these steps. So remember to check the sign first, make sure that you slide all the way to work out the exponent, make sure you bounce the binary point, the required number of spaces left or right. If the sign was negative, then you flip, you do the two's complement part, and finally you swim, which means working out the value on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the binary point. Now I'm sure that if this doesn't work for you, you can come up with your own creative way of remembering it. Now let's move on to the problems with floating point. Now we discovered quite a few, especially to do with the range and the accuracy, and that depends on the number of bits allocated for it. And many uses of floating point numbers, especially in extended mathematical procedures, involve repeated calculations. So what happens is that if we're going to be using floating points in weather forecasting or perhaps economic forecasting, there might be a slight approximation in recording the results of each calculation. Now these might not be huge on their own, but these so-called rounding errors can become quite significant if calculations are repeated enough times. So imagine that 5.88 being stored at 5.875. That little difference when run a million times can lead to a big amount, a big number. And that's where we can have significant issues. And the only way that you can prevent this from becoming a serious problem is to increase the precision or accuracy of the floating point representation by using more bits for the mantissa. And that can lead to other potential problems, especially relating to the range of numbers that can be stored. A calculation can easily produce a very higher value than what is possible to be stored in the allocated mantissa and exponent bits. And this can lead to an overflow error condition because the number cannot now fit into the required space, so it poses an overflow. However, for floating point values, there's also a possibility that if a very small number is divided by a number greater than one, the result is a value smaller than the smallest that can be stored. And this is called an underflow error condition as well. So both overflow and underflow are possible depending on how many bits are allocated for mantissa and exponent. So a lot of thought needs to go into it especially from the programmer's part. That brings us to the end of this particular unit and this particular section. You should know by now what is meant by normalization. You should also understand what it means by overflow and underflow errors, especially in relation to mantissa and exponents. When a number is bigger than what could be stored in the allocated mantissa and exponent bits, then it causes an overflow. When a number is too small to be represented accurately inside the mantis and exponent, that's an underflow error. How can you improve the precision of a floating point number? You can do that by allocating more bits to the mantis part. That's all for today. I'll see you in the next one.